is our traditional December Good Morning Metro South, but also our government affairs luncheon. So we're fortunate to have everything combined today. You may have noticed the wonderful cake created by Montilio's Bakery Company as you walked in today. 100 years ago this month, a group of Brockton business leaders completed an application to Rotary International to establish the Brockton Rotary Club. Just to give you some context, 100 years ago. 100 years ago, Woodrow Wilson was the President of the United States, and nine months earlier, in April, 2017, uh, 1917, he had declared war on Germany. The United States was officially at war at this time 100 years ago. It's heartening to know that in the midst of war, Brock and business and civic leaders were meeting and looking beyond the war to establish an organization committed to fostering mutual understanding and the creation of international bonds. The war would end less than a year later on November 11, 1918, but the Brockton chapter of Rotary International continues on today, cele celebrating 100 years this month. The Brockton Rotary Club meets weekly to network and engage in public service projects. They grant scholarships to local students, fund many local charities, and support worldwide projects like eliminating polio from this earth. The community impact and ethical standards that Rotarians live by is best illustrated by the four-way test that they use their personal and professional relationships. And I'll recite those to you. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And number four, will it benefit and be beneficial to everyone concerned? Think about all the good that could come if we all led our lives by these admirable qualities and ethical standards. Whereas this is the regular meeting time each week, on Thursday at 12.15, usually over at uh, Thorny Lee Country Club, we are grateful to have uh, the Brockton Rotary Club joining us today under the leadership of President Nick McCummings. We also have with us a few of the longest standing Brockton Rotarians, each serving more than 40 years. And I think with us today, and I know some more came in, so if I don't list you, hopefully we'll give you after. We've got Steve Green, uh, owner of W. Mason, Richard Hines, president and owner of Barber Corporation, Dick Pearson, owner of Montello Heel Company. Many of these companies, you'll notice, go back to the shoe days. We also have attorney Lou Victor, Tom Sampson, and uh, Jack Butler, those two gentlemen, uh, members over 47 years of Rock and Motors Park. Please join me in a round of applause as I ask all of our Rotarians to stand as we help them kick off their centennial year. At this time, we ask everyone to rise as we salute our nation's flag. And now we sing our national anthem, the Napoleon Soares. He is a student at Massasoit Community College. He has sung for us before, and he's a wonderful young man. Napoleon. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave? O'er the land of the free 
tradition, in Rotary tradition, we sing God Bless America. I'm going to ask the Rotary to lead us off in God Bless America. Alfie? God Bless America. as we remember our servicemen and women on, uh, for their actual uh, enduring service to our country. Thank you very much. We're honored to have with us as our guest, Governor Charlie Baker. We're looking forward to hearing his thoughts as he embarks on his campaign for re-election, especially as he discusses regional initiatives that will foster a better business climate, support the state's economy, and empower the Commonwealth's gateway cities. Please make him feel welcome by giving him a big round of applause. In addition, we have many other elected officials in attendance. Their participation in this program offers them a great opportunity to better understand the concerns of business people from throughout the region. As I I would like to recognize the elected and selected officials who are here today. As I call your name, please give away, but please hold your uh, applause until the end. We have from uh, Secretary Michael, uh, Senator Michael Brady's office, Al DiGeronimo. State Representative Claire Cronin is here. Michelle, State Representative Michelle Dubois. State Representative Bill Galvin. State Representative Lou Kafka. Uh, we also have Mayor uh, Bill Carpenter with us. Uh, City Councilor Ann Beauregard. City Councilor Shirley Asak. In addition, we have uh, Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical Chairman Mark Lindy. We have from the town of Hanover, Peter uh, Matchuk. I think we saw Jack Lally come in as well, uh, Councilor Jack Lally. Uh, Councilor Bill uh, Bob uh, Sullivan, I think, was also registered. And we have uh, Town of Bridgewater Councilor at Large, Ed Haley. Also from the MLDD office, our representative Dick Dalton is here. Let's have a round of applause for all of them. We have one more person to recognize today before I introduce our MC. Uh, after more than 10 years of working at the chamber, our Vice President, uh, Alison Van Dam, will be leaving the chamber. We are saddened by our loss, but happy for her gain in uh, joining the team at General Dynamics in uh, Taunton. Uh, as many of you know, Alison graduated class valedictorian from Brockton High School. That is quite an accomplishment for the speed club. Uh, she went on from Brockton High School to uh, UMass Dunn uh, UMass. Amherst, where she majored in music and also computer uh, animation. Uh, Allison made a great and positive difference for the chamber and the community, and I just want to thank her for her service. So lastly, I just want to turn your attention to the green forms on your tables. Uh, the governor has agreed to take a few questions at the end of his comments. If you have a question, please write it out and hold it up, and someone will be by to pick it up. We'll uh, put it into the mix. It is now my pleasure to introduce our MC for today, our Chairman-elect of the Chamber Board, Fred Clark, President of Bridgewater State University. Fred. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, Governor, for being here on this beautiful snowy day. We celebrate your commitment to redeveloping urban centers as we focus our economic strategies on attracting and retaining new and innovative businesses and developing our workforce to meet the needs and demands of the future. The Chamber and the Metro South Regional Economic Development Organization, also called REDO, have engaged local strategic <laughs> partnerships and collaborations to provide infrastructure studies and advocacy to ensure the economic advancement of this region. Among these studies was a regional water and sewer study. 
Coinciding with this study, an EPA permit has been issued to allow Brockton to open a new wastewater treatment connection with neighboring towns. We are now exploring how we can expand that infrastructure into surrounding commercial districts and industrial parks. We also completed and distributed land use studies of the 65-acre Brockton Fairgrounds and 35-acre CSX Railroad. We hope to continue dialogue around the development of these parcels, as well as the possible reuse of the former Christos restaurant site, which is located directly adjacent to this building. All of these sites are of significant value to the city and the region, and we will work hard to see the highest and best uses of these sites for the benefit of our businesses and residents alike. The Chamber and the Redo have also aided in the economic advancement of this region by providing counseling, meetings, tours, referrals, programs, marketing, and resources to more than 160 businesses. Through the local and state partnerships we have and assistance that we receive, $220 million has been invested locally, leading to the creation of over 900 jobs just this year. In addition, there are a number of potential regional projects already in the pipeline, representing an investment of over $100 million. We owe a great deal of gratitude to you, Governor Baker, for recent contributions to Main Street in Brockton. And these include the relocation of the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office, which also brought 25 state troopers to downtown Brockton. The $10 million award to build a new parking garage that is necessary for business attraction and development, and the commitment to build a new state administration office at the site of the former Ganley building, also freeing up the old employment office for improvements and possible mixed-use development. That building hasn't been touched since I've been around for at least 20 or 30 years. It's great to see it um, have a new future. We finally also owe a, a great deal of gratitude to our mayor, Bill Carpenter. He's a good friend. He's also a Bridgewater State University parent. I always have to point that out. And we are so fortunate to have a city leader who truly understands the impact of having a thriving business community and the importance of local, regional, and state partnerships. Please join me in welcoming our friend, Mayor Bill Carpenter, to say a few words of welcome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to have the governor back here in the City of Champions with us. Uh, I want to, first of all, be sure to uh, thank both President Clark and President Mitchell uh, from Bridgewater State University and Massasoit Community College, uh, respectively, uh, for everything that they do for the city of Brockton and the great ongoing working partnerships we have with both of those, uh, both of those educational institutions and uh, just how important they are to the future of this city. So we appreciate uh, you making us part of this program here today. We're excited to hear the governor's remarks, and, and uh, Fred alluded to it, but I do think it's important to note that just during the past year, uh, the Baker administration has, has committed to two major investments in downtown Brockton. First, a $10 million MassWorks grant that will largely underwrite the cost of building a, a downtown parking garage, a structure that will be the transitional catalytic project in the uh, redevelopment of downtown Brockton, creating over 400 parking spaces and unlocking more than half a dozen parcels of commercial property for redevelopment, uh, I believe as soon as the shovel breaks ground on that project. And then even more recently, uh, the commitment that was made by the administration to uh, build a new a, a project that exceeds $25 million of investment building a new uh, 30,000 square foot state-of-the-art uh, state office building for the DUA in the heart of downtown Brockton at the site of the Ganley building, which is at the crossroads of Route 123 and Main Street, and a building that has to come down and uh, faced with what could have been the prospect of a vacant property in the heart of downtown for an extended period of time. And now instead, thanks to their commitment, we will have a, a beautiful brand new office building that will completely change the perception of downtown for anyone that's entering the downtown on Route 123 from the west. So, Governor, thank you very much for both of those investments in Brockton.
So I do have to comment real quickly a couple other things the governor's been speaking about lately that I do believe impact Brockton. Uh, so just yesterday, the governor announced his uh, support for the housing choice zoning reform legislation. There's probably still quite a bit of work to do on that uh, to make it become a reality. But that legislation is critical, again, to the development and the redevelopment of Brockton. The zoning reform legislation would allow for denser development, uh, denser housing development in certain areas, particularly in the areas where we're looking for near the commuter rail stations, rotating around transit-oriented development. And that would be a key. Um, along with that, it would also make it, uh, it would streamline and make it easier for cities like Brockton to enact uh, zoning ordinance changes working with the city council. So we uh, joined the governor in supporting that legislation and realized how important uh, it would be to help us continue to redevelop Brockton. And uh, just this morning, the governor was at Southeastern Vocational Tech, and as part of uh, his urban agenda, which uh, we support, uh, he announced a, a major commitment, a major investment in uh, vocational te technical education around skills gap, workforce development, workforce training. And I guess, Governor, the one ask we would have with that uh, commitment that you made this morning is that if that commitment could be expanded to bring to Brockton, we have not just the Southeastern Region of OTEC, but we have Massasoit Community College right here in the city. We have a great workforce investment board that's just one mile down the street. There's got to be a way to bring those resources together and bring that training that you've brought to Easton, which is one of the more affluent communities in all of southeastern Massachusetts, and get it here to Brockton where the people are that really need it. But the bus don't get there from here. We need to get those services here to Brockton also, in addition to everything else you're doing. Thank you. It's great to see all of you. It's great to have the governor here with us today uh, in the city of Brockton, and I look forward to his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and I just have to uh, share a little episode. So the governor's here at the head table, and he got yelled at, actually, uh, just in the few minutes he's been here. He didn't eat all of his carrots. <laughs> so just Christine from Food Services yelled at him for not eating his carrots, and he said, hey, I already have a mama. So, uh, anyway. Uh, we want to thank our host, Massasoit Community College, all of the food service folks that helped us Today, we want to thank our Government Affairs Season sponsor, UMass Boston, and today's Good Morning Metro South sponsor, Cambridge Savings Bank in particular. One of the oldest and largest community banks in Massachusetts, Cambridge Savings, Banks, Savings Bank is a full-service financial institution with approximately $2.9 billion in assets. Focusing on meeting the financial needs of local citizens and giving back to the cities and towns they serve is an integral part of Cambridge Saving, Savings Bank's historic mission. Joining us today from Cambridge Savings Bank is Senior Vice President Steve Leonard. Please join me in welcoming Steve, who will be interviewed by Masa Kambabe, a fantastic immigration attorney and Chamber Vice Chair of Community Affairs. Uh, Fred. So uh, thank you for coming, Steve. And I learned something quite interesting the other day. It seems that Cambridge Savings Bank, who's been a wonderful supporter of the Chamber of Commerce for many years, has supported this event several times uh, in the last few years. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, you've been fortunate to have the governor speak at each of the times that you guys have been a sponsor. So congratulations on that. Timing is impeccable. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure everyone is not here to listen to me, so we're very lucky. So please tell us a little bit about how 2017 has been for Cambridge Savings Bank and what have been some of the key profitability drivers uh, for your business this year. So would you please tell us about the scope of Cambridge Savings Bank's lending in recent years? Where have you seen some of the growth? 
and if you've noticed any particular success with specific property types or industries. Sure, we've had the... Uh, We've had uh, very steady growth. I'll speak specifically for our, our commercial industrial lending, which is business lending that we like to do all over Eastern Mass. And the, the group that I run has grown about 15% uh, annually over the past five years. So starting from a small base, we've created quite a, uh, uh, a sizable portfolio throughout Eastern Mass. And it's pretty well dispersed, despite the fact that our branches lie North, pretty much north of Boston, Middlesex County. Today, with technology today, lockbox, sweep accounts, we can bank businesses all over the state uh, with relative ease. So, and ironically, of my team of lenders, I have 12 lenders, um, and about 40% of them live south of Boston. Now, why they do that when they have to get to Harvard Square on a regular basis is beyond me. But that's what they do. Could you tell us about some of the recent successes uh, in the Metro South region in particular? Sure. Uh, we're a generalist bank, so we actually bank all industries. So just to give you an example of a couple of things that we, we've done over the past year. We actually did a, we have a boat manufacturer uh, in the Metro South area, um, a small manufacturer in Stoughton. Um, we're about to open. We hope to open a, um, a closed accounts for manufacturing in Brockton, uh, maybe by the end of this uh, year. Mr. Moran is working on that for us. And I, I have to thank Rockton Trust. Uh, about a year, two years ago, got us involved with Signature Hospital. We've been very happy with that relationship. It's been great. Um, and Rockland Trust actually you know, came and brought us in there. So we give some kudos there. Um, but a, a variety, a variety of industries. And lastly, would you please tell us about the bank's involvement in the community and if you have any particular plans for the Metro South community in the near future? <coughs> sure. I am not good with them. We, did, we do about, uh, we donate about a million dollars annually. So out of our earnings, out of our, say, $24 million in earnings this year, we do about a million dollars annually to a variety of uh, community uh, nonprofit entities throughout Eastern Mass. Um, we're expanding our presence here. We have folks who are members of this, with uh, Metro South, obviously Metro South, with C, um, uh, the uh, social Y, and I think that'll continue. Um, our, our bankers tend to be very committed. Uh, as I said, they get involved in their community, um, and that's that's how we network and, and ultimately to generate business. Well, thank you so much for being part of our luncheon today, and we appreciate all that Cambridge Saving pleasure to introduce a great friend, a colleague, a Bridgewater State University fellow alumnus, I have to mention that also, uh, interim president, acting president, Bill Mitchell, the president of Massasoit Community College and our gracious host of today's meal. Thank you, Fred. Then, Governor, welcome back to Massasoit. We're glad to have you here. First of all, I want to thank the local delegation and the mayor of Brockton for their steadfast support for Massasoit, especially the support that they show for our students. Although Massasoit has at different times worked with many of you in the room here this afternoon, some of you might not know that we had more than 7,000 credit students this past fall. Well, that corporate and community ed enrolls 3,000 non-credit students each year for corporate and workforce training. 
In fact, the division is currently partnering with the Brockton 21st Century Corp under the new Brockton Transformative Work Workforce Initiative to provide an English literacy program free of cost to those who qualify with Stairway to Recovery of Brockton to provide recovery coach training. And with local and corporate and community partners like South Shore Bank and Senti Supermarket to provide trainings that help them strengthen their workforce. On the academic side of the house, we continue to listen to the needs of our communities and build programs that help our students be successful in their careers, both vocationally and academically. Students in our veterinary technician program, funded in part by a generous capital skills grant from the Baker Polito administration, are thriving. We received full national accreditation this year, and 100% of our first graduating class was employed in their field within two months of graduation. brand new state-of-the-art engineering labs, also funded in part by another capital skills grant from the Baker Polito administration, is set to open for our students this January. This new program began in 2015 with 63 students. This fall, enrollment grew to 173 students. We also continue to strengthen collaborations with our regional higher education partners. This August, we signed an articulation agreement with Cape Cod Community College to provide our students the opportunity to start with us and continue on with Cape Cod to complete the Aviation Maintenance Management Associate Degree Program at the Plymouth Airport. We are also launching a new MCC to BSU program which provides students transferring to Bridgewater State University a more seamless transition between schools as well as guaranteed admission to VSU in early access to programs, activities, and advising at both colleges. Thank you, President. I know that we have a lot more to do to help our community and students grow and prosper. Massasoit is actively working with the city and state officials on projects that benefit the students of Massasoit, the citizens of Brockton, and the surrounding communities. Specifically, we are looking at the former Christos property right next door for a possible public-private partnership in the area of health care and housing. And I look forward to continuing these conversations. I have the unique opportunity as the interim president of an institution where I was once a student to sow the seeds of change and growth. I am honored to lead Massasoit Community College, and I look forward to working with stakeholders in the coming months to help open doors for students at all levels of their careers and educational journeys. It is now my pleasure to introduce our special guest today, Governor Charlie Baker. <laughs> Governor Charlie Baker was inaugurated as the 70th second governor of Massachusetts on January 8, 2015. Since taking office, Baker closed the budget gap of more than $2 billion without raising taxes. He has supported the business community by reforming the Commonwealth's regulatory environment, holding the line on taxes, and advancing efforts to rein in energy costs. In response to the de devastating opioid in heroin epidemic, Baker has worked on plans for prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery support. Governor Baker has also worked to overhaul the MBTA by appointing a fiscal and management control board to oversee the system's operation and finances and prioritize investments in the core system that over one million daily riders depend on. Recently, Governor Baker announced a housing initiative designed to achieve a goal of 135,000 new housing units by 2025. And of course, he also announced his intention of running for re-election. Please join me in welcoming our governor, Charlie Baker.
I'm almost afraid to start speaking because I don't know if this is going to work or not. It's not. Is that better? Well, let me first of all start by uh, asking you all to give a big round of applause to the folks who are working the tables here. They're working very hard. Even though I got bagged for not eating all of my carrots, I ate more than half of them, by the way. Um, what she didn't, she had another opportunity to let me have it because I started to eat the cake before I finished my meal. You gotta love Montilias, huh? I mean, the work that they do is extraordinary. That cake in the lobby is really something. Um, and, and to the mayor, I would just say that um, we very much appreciate our working relationship with you. And uh, the mayor also served on our opioid task force, which I'll talk a little more about in a minute. But one of the fundamental tenets that Karen Polito and I have tried to bring into our administration is this notion that um, a strong commonwealth is 351 strong cities and towns. Uh, no one, when they get asked how things are going, answers that question by how they think things are going on Beacon Hill. They answer that question based on how they think things are going in their home, in their neighborhood, in their community. And if things aren't going well in their home, their neighborhood, in their community, then what's going on on Beacon Hill or what's going on some other place in Massachusetts loses a lot of its relevance. And because of that, we've tried to make our primary focus on working with our colleagues in the legislature, many of whom are here today, thanks for joining, um, and our colleagues in local government to help people max on their strengths and, uh, and work to mitigate or improve on whatever they may see as their, their problems going forward. And, and that's translated into a whole series of approaches to governing, and one of them starts with uh, the way we choose to build our budgets. And over the course of the last three years, Again, working with our colleagues in the legislature, we basically started with funding on unrestricted local aid and on education aid, and then everything else has sort of come after that. And I think for a lot of folks in local government, that's meant a lot more predictability for them with respect to their own budgeting activities, and a sense that the state is pretty serious about trying to find a way uh, to collaborate with them and to ensure that uh, if state tax revenue goes up by 2%, then local aid is going to go up by at least that much as well. And, and that's a group effort. That doesn't happen because the governor or lieutenant governor thinks it's a good idea. It happens because uh, we get to work collaboratively with the legislative group that's willing to see things the same way we do on that one. And I think you should give the folks who are here from the legislature uh, a round of applause because they've been terrific partners. I also do want to spend a minute on um, another, two other local initiatives. One is, I worked in local government, I worked in state government. I was in the cabinet of Bill Weld and Paul Salucci in the 90s, and I served as a member of my board of selectmen in Swampscott, which is where I live. And I've seen how this movie works from both sides. And one of the things I learned when I served in local government is the state historically has a tendency to just say, do this, we're not going to give you any money, have a nice day. And, um, and that kind of hurts, actually, if you're in the local level and you're trying to figure out how to make stuff work. So what we did was we said, here's a whole menu of best practices. And you can choose to work on some of them or not. If you choose to work on them, we'll give you technical assistance, which will be funded by the Commonwealth, again, in conjunction with the legislature. And if you work on those, you can get points when you bid on state grants. And we did this early on in our administration with no idea about whether or not anybody in local government would pursue it. But as I stand here today, out of the 351 cities and towns, about 320 of them have voluntarily signed up to work on at least one best practice, and many are working on more than that. Uh, there are about 750 best practices in all that cities and towns have been working on. Um, again, with technical support and assistance from the Commonwealth. And this is translated into some really important initiatives. In some cases, it's translated into bond upgrades for cities and towns. In some cases, it's the first time they've been able to figure out how to create a regional approach 
to education policy, or emergency management services, or public safety, or library services, or a whole series of other things that they were never quite able to get over the line. In other cases, it translated into policies around environmental policy, downtown development, economic development. And for us, it was this amazing learning experience where we got a sense about which issues around the Commonwealth were the ones people really wanted us to drill on and to work on. And so that led to a 200-page um, municipal modernization bill that took years, 50 years, worth of old rules, requirements, goo, that got in the way of cities and towns' ability to do their job. And again, working with the legislature, got that passed, and the Mass Municipal Association called it the most important advancement in state municipal finance law that have been passed in the past 50 years. And usually when you have an event at the State House to talk about local government, am I doing something with this? No. Um, just checking. Usually when you have an event at the State House and you invite a lot of local officials to it, if you're not giving anybody any money, it's pretty hard to get anybody to come. But in this particular case, we had over a hundred cities and towns show up for the bill signing on this because it made their life and their ability to do their job so much easier. In addition to that, we also figured out that there were all kinds of small bridges all over the Commonwealth owned by local community. Everybody thinks bridges, they think state bridges, right? And we've probably repaired uh, and rehabilitated about 80, 80 of them since we took office. But one of the things we learned when we got into this whole program around best practices was that most of the bridges in Massachusetts are actually owned by cities and towns. And sometimes they can use the Chapter 90 money they get from us and other funding they get uh, to fix and repair them, and sometimes they can't. So we created a small bridge program that gave cities and towns the ability to bid on that if they wanted to do work associated with fixing their bridges. In addition to that, we learned that a lot of folks had issues with sidewalks. And so we created another program called the Complete Street Program, which makes it possible for cities and towns to bid on those grant funds and to combine them with their own money or with Chapter 90 funny funding to redo a lot of the public ways that they would like to incorporate sidewalks into. Um, bike paths, you know, another one that came up as part of this conversation as a result over the course of four years, we'll probably spend $100 million, no joke, $100 million on connecting and improving um, bike paths uh, all over the Commonwealth of Mass. And, and these are things that come from this ongoing, constant dialogue between us and the Commonwealth cities and towns about what are the things we can do to help you get better. The decision to put the, uh, the DUA building in downtown, that came about as a result of a series of conversations with the mayor. The decision with the DA's office, same thing. Um, the conversation we're starting with the Christos property, the Enterprise Center. These are things where um, that ongoing, constant conversation gives us the ability to figure out what's really on people's minds, which you don't get through sort of the once in a while type conversations, and then to actually create a conversation that can translate into something that will help people move their community forward. The Skill Capital Grant Program that, that uh, Massasoit got a grant on, Brockton High School got a grant on, um, and uh, Southeastern Voc Tech got a grant on. That one came about through a series of conversations with small businesses and local businesses as we were doing some of these community visits who said, you know, there's all these jobs that people just had the right skills, they have to get credentialed for them, um, there are people who are actually in a position to provide this kind of skill base for people, but they don't in many cases have the right equipment to do it. So we said, fine. We put together this program. The legislature, God bless you, funded it. Um, and we put about $40 million out um, to vocational and technical schools, community colleges, other skill building organizations, almost all of which is tied to employers who say, yeah, if you guys invest in this, we will invest alongside you and we will be able to hire the folks who come out of those programs and give them good jobs in our communities so that they can be successful and grow and develop. And I think one of the things we've tried to do day in and day out is work on this assumption that we as the Commonwealth can be a great leverage 
for a lot of the work that's going on at the local and regional level, and not the other way around. It's not supposed to be about us telling people this is what we want you to do. It should be about us saying, where are the places and the spaces and the opportunities, whether they're in environmental policy, transportation, education, economic development, public safety, where we can actually help you solve your problems. One of the big things we heard from almost everybody about transportation was we weren't doing a good job with basic maintenance of our roads, all right? So over the course of the past three years, we've repaved 2,000 miles of road in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I want you to think about that one for a minute. Um, we've also heard from many people that we weren't doing enough um, with respect to the way we handled um, the stitching that we can provide on downtown development and housing projects. So we significantly upped our investment in the MassWorks program, which is where the Enterprise Center grant came from. But that MassWorks program is the single best tool we have to help people put the finishing touch on a development initiative. Sometimes it's utility work. Sometimes it's sidewalks. Sometimes it's a parking garage. It's, it's, but it's basically this great program it's been around state government for a long time, but we really brought it to the fore and put some additional resources behind it. Because over and over again, what we were hearing from folks at the local level is we're this close. We just need somebody to help us do X. And then we'll be able to figure out a way to follow through and deliver on it. We did the same thing with our housing initiative. Um, significantly expanded our investment in housing. And because of what we were hearing from folks in local communities, we created a workforce housing program. So that our housing program wasn't just about affordable housing, wasn't just about public housing, but was also about working in many cases with private developers and others to do more workforce housing. Because the big message we were getting is young families, middle income people, those are the folks who in many cases are getting priced out of our communities. That's where we need you to go forward. And that then led to a long set of conversations, literally, that have been going on for almost a year about what are we going to do to create more housing in the Commonwealth of Mass. More housing for um, students going to work, joining the workforce, more housing for young families, more housing for middle income families, more housing for seniors, more supported housing for seniors. How are we going to do this given that historically this conversation has just been a brawl between state government which wants to do one thing, local government which wants to do another, and local uh, developers and local residents who want to chase a different one. Now, we could have just filed the same kind of bill everybody's filed historically and it would have, you know, kind of gone nowhere and done nothing. Um, but instead what we did was we literally had a series of conversations that lasted almost a year with everybody who plays in this space. It's led to this housing choices bill that we filed last week. And, um, and what we did was we said, we need to give locals more tools. We don't need to tell them what to do, but we need to give them more tools. So there's a big piece of that legislation um, which gives locals more tools. Second thing we said is we need to put some financial resources behind that. We have a bond bill pending, which I'm quite sure all the members of the legislature are going to pass the day after you come back in January. <laughs> um, and uh, not to put it, you can do it after you get the criminal justice in done, right? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and put some of our own resources behind it. So there's 10 million a year uh, coming from, uh, in addition to the housing bond stuff coming behind that. And the third thing we said was, and we have to figure out some way to do this uh, on terms that will make it possible for folks in the development community to feel like they have the predictability they need to move forward. So we had an event to file the bill and we had mayors and city managers and city councilors and zoning folks and planning folks and uh, housing developers and real estate folks and affordable housing development. I mean, we had everybody you could think of standing behind us because we put the time into figuring out what the path forward could be on this that might actually translate into 135,000 new units of housing over the course of the next six years or so. And I think in some ways um, that's because we start with this notion that if we can find the common ground, the common ground on Beacon Hill, the common ground in communities, the common ground between and among the various players. If we listen for it, if we work on the proposition here that this isn't a contest about who wins today's food fight that will be on the news tonight, 
but is actually an attempt to find the places and spaces where people agree over a larger arching goal, which is to try to find a way to create more housing in Massachusetts so that people can afford to be here, maybe there's a path to success. And all of this for us always works on this notion, stronger, better communities. And in different parts of Massachusetts, it's a different thing. In gateway cities, it's different than what it is in Western Mass, which is different than what it is along the coast. We reinvigorated the Seaport Council because we have 75 coastal communities in Massachusetts which are really struggling to figure out what to do with their waterfronts for all kinds of reasons. We work with the legislature to get additional funding to build the last mile for high-speed internet for 58 communities in Western Mass that don't have it. I want you to think about how hard it is to actually attract young people, keep young people, attract businesses, create a future in this day and age if you don't have high-speed internet. I went and visited a bunch of these businesses. And you had restaurants literally running dial-up on a Friday or Saturday night to keep track of everything. The tables that were being used, um, bills, meals, the bar, the whole nine yards. And if the dial-up goes poof, then you're, which used to happen a lot, you're screwed. Right? So there's a reason why those 58 communities didn't have it. It's really hard and frustrating to figure out how to get it done. But again, by partnering with the communities, partnering with a number of the telecom and, and, and cable companies, and bringing our resources to bear and some of theirs, we got plans in place for 52 of the 58, and we'll get the last six done. And on the gateway community piece, it's not the same answer everywhere, because they're not the same. But for the most part, it's about downtown strategies, greening of those communities. We've planted 10,000 trees in Gateway City since we took office. I think you're on the hook to plant about 2,400, Mr. Mayor. Good luck with that. Um, hey, the first 800 are almost in. See, exactly. But it's not just about planting them, right? You've got to figure out where you're going to plant them, where you get the best opportunity to create the right kind of space for it, and then you need to have partnerships with people at the local level who are actually going to take care of them. So you plant them and they grow and good things happen. Um, and I think in many ways that's the way we think about this, this role and this responsibility. Working with our colleagues, whatever your particular political affiliation might be, to build strong communities from one end of Massachusetts to the other. Be tough on the issues, soft on the people, and recognize that everybody's not always supposed to agree. You know, my mom and dad canceled each other out for 60 years in elections. <laughs> you know, she, God rest her soul, was a Democrat. Uh, my dad's a Republican. Laser light show across the dinner table every night. <laughs> but they were having a conversation, and I learned a lot from listening to my parents talk. And one of the biggest things I learned is no one has the answer to everything. And the people who lose in this conversation, and I don't mean lose, win, lose, I mean lose opportunity, are the ones who don't listen. And the ones who don't... <laughs> and the ones who can't or won't choose to hear what the other person's point of view is. Now we have a pretty open door policy in our administration, and, and I'm pretty sure folks who deal with us would say, um, that we try to be as solution-oriented as we can within the framework of the finite system we live in, whether it's regulatory finite, statutory finite, or financially finite. But we also are big believers that if you keep talking and working this stuff, you can find a path to success. And I would argue the opioid issue is another one where we have a long way to go but with a ton of work by a lot of people, we are making progress. Now, after 15 years of double-digit increases, and I happen to consider this to be one of the most important healthy community issues of all, because you're not going to find a community in Massachusetts that hasn't been hit by this thing. Um, after 15 years of double-digit growth, and sometimes 20 and 30 and 40 percent, in prescriptions, overdoses, and deaths in Massachusetts, every single year for 15 years, Every year. Awful. I said when we signed the first legislation on this, 
a collaborative effort with our colleagues in the legislature and elsewhere, um, that I'd never seen anything with so much negative momentum. And here we are, nine months through 17, and for the first time in 15 years, deaths are down, prescriptions are down, and because of the availability of Narcan, again, on a collaborative, collective basis, um, overdoses have um, flattened out and nowhere near as many people are dying. Now, That's the good news. The bad news is we still have a really long way to go, which is why we filed what I call sort of the second act on this opioid issue, which is a piece of legislation that's designed to do a bunch of things. And I'm, again, looking forward to working with my colleagues in the legislature on this one. But the big piece was to try to create some structure around the aftercare piece. Because right now, if you're a family dealing with this, it's really hard to figure out what works and what doesn't, and where you go, and how you should help your family member, and all that. There are a lot of folks in the addiction community who've done great work for a really long time, in many cases ignored by the rest of healthcare. Okay? But the truth is, people believe recovery coaches are a good idea. So do I. What is it? There's no definition for it. Well, let's create a credentialing process for that, and then make sure people who do this get paid for their work, and we track how they perform. Same thing goes with a lot of the counseling services that are supposed to support medication-assisted treatment. And let's figure out what the real evidence base is here so that families and people who are dealing with these issues have some place to go, the same way we do with congestive heart failure or diabetes or heart disease or most other chronic conditions. Because this is not an issue that's going to be a quick fix solve. This is going to be one of these ones that we're going to have to work on and battle year after year after year for an extended, sustained period of time. We didn't get here overnight. We don't get out overnight. But again, it's one of these issues that requires a com com collaborative and comprehensive bite-by-bite, day-by-day approach to solving it. And the final thing I would just say is um, in this day and age where so much of what happens in public life and in politics is about division. I am very grateful that I get to live and work in a state where at every level of government and in every community there are good people trying to do the right thing, working hard, avoiding the character assassination and the foolishness that in many cases some people call political dialogue and try to move their community and this great commonwealth forward. It has been an enormous blessing for me and for the folks on my team, for Karen and for my family to be part of this great democracy that people built here in the great state of Massachusetts. Thank you. Event and I used to work for a legislator and I can feel I can feel the pain of you folks over in the corner here. So uh, you're very popular, Governor. I have a lot of questions. I'm just gonna a, a lot of it does come down to one issue and that is the relationship between Massachusetts and the federal government. I think everybody's been looking to Washington much more than we have in the past. And I think the question really the questions most of them really are about. Um, the impacts in Massachusetts of what's happening in Washington, the impacts for local businesses and families with health care, for transportation, for education, for housing, you know, today taxes. And uh, if you could just comment in a general way of uh, what are you worried about, what are the opportunities, the threats that might be on your mind so that we can be maybe worried or optimistic along with you. First of all, I want to thank you for asking me a really easy question. Um, and thank you, Fred. Um, here's what I would say. Um, I spent a lot of time over the course of the last year, way more than I ever thought, 
um, working on this healthcare stuff at the federal level. And that typically involved conversations and dialogue and um, advocacy with other governors, some of whom were Republican and some of whom were Democrats, uh, many of whom had similar kinds of healthcare systems to the one we have here in Massachusetts, um, and could talk to their delegations the same way I was talking to ours. And, um, and I'm thankful that uh, with a ton of work by a lot of people, uh, we've been able to preserve a lot of the key elements that make the healthcare system here in the Commonwealth, um, one that I believe we can all be enormously proud of. Um, in addition to that, we spent a ton of time on um, a whole series of issues around visas and immigration and H-1Bs and H-2Bs, and, um, and, and we have work to do there. And, and these are tough issues. They're really tough issues for families. They're really tough issues for colleges and universities. They're tough issues for communities. Um, and I guess what I would say is here too, um, I can find sort of like-minded folks sitting in other state capitals and other governor's offices and work with them to make our case to Congress uh, and to the administration. Um, and, I, and I hope we win more often than we don't. Um, but this is going to continue to be uh, an ongoing concern, certainly, of, of ours. I mean, a big part of what, Massachusetts, what makes Massachusetts work is, uh, is the fact that we are a welcoming and global community. And we have benefited tremendously from the cultures and the and the points of view and the, and the histories of the people who, uh, who've either lived here for five generations um, or who got here uh, last year. And I, I really, I can tell you we will continue to work hard to make sure that we can continue to benefit from, um, from the shared experiences that so many different people from around the globe uh, who are part of this community here in the Commonwealth uh, can bring to it. Uh, I think on transportation, you know, a lot of us are still expecting at some point, and I say, I know I speak for many governors when I say this, the infrastructure bill, okay? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about this um, among Democrats and Republicans and the President in Washington for a year. And it's something that you can find tremendous support sort of across the political spectrum for, um, and I'm really hoping that that ends up being one of the things that all those folks down there uh, can find a way to work together on uh, to help us move not just the Commonwealth forward, but the country forward. And, um, and with respect to the tax bill, I, you know, I saw the House version, I saw the Senate version, I don't know. There, I've seen the headlines that say that there is agreement on this. I don't know what's in that agreement, but I can tell you this, I've talked to Susan Collins, who's the state uh, U.S. Senator from the state of Maine, who's probably the best voice, at least for me, to talk to um, because her vote is so pivotal on this stuff. And it made very clear to her what my big concerns were. The first was the reduction in the mortgage interest deduction for homeowners, which is just a huge blow to anybody who lives in a, in a community or in a state that has housing costs um, and housing prices that are above the national average, which that's us, okay? Um, she said she was going to work very hard to make sure that that didn't end up in the final bill. I don't know if it did or not. The second big issue uh, for us in that final bill is losing the federal deductibility associated with state and local taxes. Now, what I can tell you on that is when I talked to her about that, she said that um, they were going to work very hard uh, to try to mitigate that. And that meant raising some of the, deduct some of the automatic exemptions and deductions and doing some other stuff. Um, I don't know what's in the final bill, so I don't know what the answer is there. I, I guess what I would say, just can generally, is we spend a lot of time talking to our delegation. I spend a lot of time, personally, myself, talking to other governors in New England and in other parts of the country who have similar kinds of economies and similar kinds of healthcare systems and similar kinds of, um, of, of issues. Uh, and I try to make those conversations and those those outreach efforts as constructive as I can in advocating on behalf of what makes the most sense for Massachusetts. I think we have been somewhat successful in a number of areas in terms of stopping things we thought would be bad and a number of others of actually getting things that we thought would be good. Um, but this is a constant, um, 
that this requires constant vigilance. And what I would say to all of you uh, is that it's very important that you stay vigilant as well. Um, because as I said in my State of the State last year, um, irrespective of party, right? You know, we, we deal very well, Republicans and Democrats in Massachusetts, on stuff that relates to us. And my view is the same thing on the way to Washington, which is um, if I can find Republicans um, that I agree with and that will work with us on issues I care about, great. If I can find Democrats, that's great too. I try to make the conversation and the advocacy with the folks in D.C. about the issues that matter here in Massachusetts. And, and I would urge all of you to, to try and do the same. Um, the NIH funding, huge issue for the, uh, for the healthcare community. We worked really hard on that one, and I think we're going to end up in a really good place after starting in a really bad place. But that one, too, happened in part because we chased, um, we chased a lot of folks all over the country who we believed had shared interests in ensuring that the NIH was adequately and appropriately funded. Um, I hope you all have a really nice holiday, and God bless. And we look forward to working with the mayor and the legislative delegation and all of you on continuing to build great communities here in Metro South. Thank you. Christmas and what do you think you're going to get? I want my kids home and I'm going to get it. <laughs> well, the, governor, uh, the governor is going to go, but before he does, we have a special citation in honor of the Brockton Rotary Club Centennial. Can we have Rotary President Nick McCummings come up, Chris Cooney come up, uh, Jack Butler, Tom Sampson, who joined the Rotary 47 years ago, wow. President-elect Richard Hook, and Rotary District Governor Steve Serta all join us on stage for the presentation of the uh, Okay, everybody looking right this way. Perfect.